Hello everyone, as part of our Better Outcomes webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live webinar. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's broadcast. The name of today's webinar is Mechanical Insufflation Exsufflation for Airway Mucus Clearance, When, How and Where. And now I'd like to introduce you to Lou Saparito, who is our moderator today. Lou is the Muscular Dystrophy Association Respiratory Care Evaluator and Trainer at the University Medical Center in Newark, New Jersey. He is also the Respiratory Home Care Consultant at Millennium Respiratory Services located in Whippany, New Jersey. Lou specializes in ventilation management in inpatient and outpatient settings with emphasis on non-invasive methods of ventilation and lung clearance. Lou, welcome and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and thank you, Emily for that kind introduction. The title uh, of today's webinar, once again, is Mechanical Insufflation Exufflation for Airway Mucus Clearance, When, How, and Where. We are very fortunate to have an extremely qualified speaker today presenting on this very important and timely topic. Speaking today on this topic is a good colleague of mine. Dr. Bach has been on the faculty of the Rutgers University New Jersey Medical School, where he is a professor of phys physical medicine and rehabilitation and uh, is the medical director of the Center for Ventilatory Management Alternatives at the University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey. He has over 400 peer-reviewed scientific articles and book chapters and 10 medical textbooks on neuromuscular and pulmonary medicine and has lectured on these topics in 70 countries. Dr. Bach has disclosed that he has no conflicts of interest. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour and a link to obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of the webinar. Support for this educational activity has been provided by Philips Healthcare in honor of uh, Respiratory Care Week and we'd like to welcome especially all the respiratory therapists that are participating today. And now uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Bach uh, to begin his presentation. Thank you very much, Lou, and uh, for all of you out there, during the next hour you will learn how to prevent otherwise inevitable respiratory failure and invasive airway intubation for your patients with uh, respiratory muscle weakness. You will be greatly appreciated by your patients for learning this material and uh, applying it. Upon completion of this activity, you should be able to explain how mechanical inexufflation devices can make ventilator weaning parameters and spontaneous breathing trials completely useless. Describe how non-invasive um, mechanical inexufflation can be administered safely and effectively, and describe how it can be used uh, in conjunction with uh, oximetry feedback to prevent acute respiratory failure. Because invasive airway suctioning misses the left main stem bronchus over 90% of the time, and for patients, uh, as a result of that, patients with uh, respiratory muscle weakness, uh, eight, over 80% of pneumonias for them are in the left lung. So this is the reason why it's so important to use mechanical inexufflation because uh, this device, uh, these devices do not preferentially clear one airway over the other. Uh, also, it permits, uh, w without it, uh, it is almost impossible to continue non-invasive ventilatory support uh, for patients with little or no vital capacity or respiratory muscle function whatsoever without resort to tracheostomy tubes. Uh, you will see that our patients, uh, many cases, uh, um, with, uh, are, are, have been dependent on continuous non-invasive respiratory support for over 60 years uh, with no hospitalizations or any need to resort to invasive airway tubes. What about using vibration, percussion, oscillation? Well, this is fine if you're dealing with patients with airways diseases like cystic fibrosis. Uh, however, the trachea divides 27 times uh, into a respiratory tree of 27 divisions. The first six divisions must be cleared by coughing. The next 20 or so divisions are cleared by the mucociliary elevator, uh, bringing debris up towards the central division so that they can be coughed out. Um, vibration, oscillation, and so on uh, can, are not a substitute for effective coughing. They are, cannot 
um, help your patients with primarily um, respiratory muscle insufficiency. This is a cough later. It's in my office. It was on the market in 1953, and it came off the market in 1967 when physicians and clinicians were resorting to tracheostomy tubes. There is no evidence in the literature whatsoever that this device was ever used through a tracheostomy tube until I started doing it basically in 1988. In 1988, two of my patients who had access to these devices um, over the years from the 1960s uh, put this uh, article in a local New Jersey newspaper begging for a company to put this device back on the market. I went to every ventilator manufacturer that I knew in the United States. All of them uh, basically ignored me, turned me down, said they were working on negative pressure, with one exception, Mr. Jack Emerson. Mr. Emerson, the man who put iron lungs on the market in 1931, gave me uh, such a device in two months. In two months, he gave me a device that I immediately started using in critical care. And in February of 1993, I helped him get his inexiflator on the market. And since then, there have been five or six generations of mechanical inexiflation devices. And besides the uh, Philips Respironics model, uh, it is being manufactured by at least four or five other countries around uh, the planet. The uh, Philips uh, cough assist does have two distinct advantages over any other devices that I know of at this time. One is that it permits us to measure the cough flows that are being generated by it. And this has uh, permitted me to discover that for certain conditions with upper motor neuron disease or central nervous system disease, the flows may be inadequate or become inadequate with time to, to, to efficiently clear the airways and the patients then may need tracheostomy tubes. This does not happen in anybody with myopathic disease or lower motor neuron disease. No one with spinal muscular atrophy type 1, 2, or 3 really should ever need a tracheostomy tube, and that is certainly true for patients with myopathies and muscular dystrophies. No one with Duchenne muscular dystrophy should ever need a tracheostomy tube for respiratory management whatsoever. And in large part, it's uh, thanks to this machine, as well as non-invasive ventilatory support. By the way, um, other than my own papers, no one else ever describes benefits of non-invasive ventilation to include ventilatory support. But believe me, with the use of um, mechanical inexiflation, uh, non-invasive ventilation can be used for full ventilatory support at full ventilatory support settings. Likewise, you need full cough assist settings when you use the cough assist. When it's used through a mouthpiece or the upper airway, you must use 40 to 60 centimeters of water pressure. And when it's used through a translaryngeal tube or tracheostomy tube, you need 60 to 70 centimeters of water pressure. And you administer it to full chest inflation, then immediate full chest emptying, and then you reproduce that. The pressures on the device are not the pressures in the lungs. In fact, if you use less than 30 centimeters of water pressure, it'll take 10 seconds or more to inflate the chest and ex exiflate the chest, another 10 seconds, and now your patient is only breathing three times a minute. This is not the way to use this device. You must use it at sufficiently high pressures to rapidly inflate the chest and exiflate the chest so that the patient does not become short of breath and you get adequate flows to expulse airway debris. This is a 72-year-old who fell, broke his neck, and with a vital capacity of under 200 milliliters, we removed his tracheostomy tube, converted him to non-invasive ventilatory support, and here you can see a large mucus plug that was brought up to his mouth by the, the, the inexiflator, what's now called the cough assist. And the uh, same with the two and a half year old, uh, also tracheostomy tube removed, and uh, she, by the age of two and a half, most children cooperate very nicely with this device. Uh, this is a woman who failed multiple extubation attempts until we were called and introducing the cough assist, which she was able to use on her own. She succeeded in being extubated uh, from an acute exacerbation of my myasthenia gravis. Uh, this fellow uh, kept his tracheostomy tube and therefore remained vent dependent. Uh, he would not have been dependent on a ventilator during the daytime had we removed his tracheostomy tube, but he kept it. Interestingly, though, he traveled everywhere in the world with his cough assist because he realized that using it through his tracheostomy tube was far more comfortable and effective than airway suctioning. So use it at 40 to 60 centimeters of water through the upper airway. You can apply an exhalation timed abdominal thrust.
which increases exafflation flows uh, for 20% of patients. It really helps increase flows when you're using the cofacist at inadequate pressures. But when you use it at optimal pressures, the abdominal thrust uh, may not increase flows any longer. You can also use the cough assist in conjunction with the patient attempting to cough on his own. For many patients, that also increases the flows. Again, it can be used through any non-invasive interface, including a mouthpiece, for babies or, or, or tracheostomy tube or translaryngeal tube. For babies, we like to use the cough track, which is the other interesting um, application of the cough assist. It permits the patient to trigger the machine, and when babies, we before, we tried to time the machine to the baby's uh, coughing with it, or uh, breathing, that is. We timed the machine to the baby's breathing, but, you know, these babies can breathe 40 or 50 times a minute. It becomes very difficult, if not impossible. The cough track does facilitate um, synchrony of the child with the machine. So, historically, patients were ventilated in body ventilators. And then when it was discovered that uh, tracheostomy tubes can permit patients to come out of iron lungs and positive pressure ventilators could be rolled behind them, that was helpful for their rehabilitation. But there are so many complications of tracheostomy ventilation. In fact, four out of five of our patients on trach ventilation die because of the tracheostomy tubes, that there's now a return to non-invasive management. Uh, in 1834, this is what the first iron lung looked like. And then when electricity came about in 1929, here's another example of the drinker iron lung. And in 1931, the Emerson iron lung, where Emerson placed a dome around the head so that when the nurse was doing nursing care to the body, the patient was ventilated by positive pressure going through the dome. I asked Mr. Emerson why he didn't simply give the woman a mouthpiece, and he said, well, because we never thought of it. So in 1952, uh, when there was a large polio epidemic in Denmark, uh, all their patients got traked. And this spread to the United States. For four months, medical students bagged patients through their trach tubes 24 hours a day. Um, and then the Danes put the Pulsula ventilator on the market, and this could be rolled behind the patients uh, in their wheelchairs. Why not simply trach all of these patients who are too weak to breathe? The trach tube is a foreign body. It is, a, it is um, colonized by pathogenic bacterial contamination to the extent that all patients with trach tubes have as much pathogenic bacteria in their alveoli as anybody with acute pneumonia. Also, 17 to 65 percent of patients with trach tubes develop tracheal stenosis. Once this happens, we can no longer remove their tracheostomy tubes. 32 out of 40 of our ALS patients who got trach died because of the tubes. Our only neuromuscular disease patients who do get trach are patients with uh, ALS. This is because the upper motor neuron component causes spasticity in the upper airway, which makes the cough assist ineffective over time. So typically, their cough assist exafflation flows may be as high as 350 or 400 liters a minute. But as the hypertonicity occurs, these decrease over time, and when they get down to about 100 liters a minute, uh, the patients uh, need to be traked for further survival. This does not happen, as I mentioned, in patients with muscular dystrophy, any myopathies, or in spinal muscular atrophy, or any, my or any neuropathies for that matter. <clears throat> Tracheotomy also eliminates the ability to cough because the glottis cannot close and hold pressures. And suctioning simply does not get the left main stem bronchus 90% of the time. The cough assist, on the other hand, provides 10 liters per second of ex expiratory flow via the left and the right airways. Now, non-invasive ventilation, or NIV, has gotten to be synonymous with continuous positive airway pressure and bi-level positive airway pressure. In the literature, CPAP is completely useless for patients with neuromuscular weakness, and bi-level positive airway pressure is widely used at low spans, low drive pressures, that is, IPAPs minus EPAP less than 10. Well, this is useful for treating central and obstructive apneas. The polysomnogram is not programmed to interpret any hypoventilation as being due to respiratory muscle weakness. So the sleep doctors that prescribe this uh, typically do not prescribe BiPAP at ventilatory support settings, and their patients must then inevitably develop acute respiratory failure, be intubated, and then the, then the intensive care physicians think 
that when they're no longer weanable, when they cannot pass spontaneous breathing trials and ventilator weaning parameters, they think that they need tracheostomy tubes for further survival. This is absolutely not true. But the NIV is why we now coin the um, abbreviation NVS to distinguish it from CPAP and BiPAP. And non-invasive ventilatory support, no EPAP and no PEEP are needed. The three aspects to management are long-term non-invasive management with non-invasive ventilatory support and mechanical inexufflation. Also, we routinely extubate unweanable patients to non-invasive ventilatory support and mechanical inexufflation. And we also decannulate patients who are often unweanable to non-invasive ventilatory support and mechanical inexufflation. Uh, spinal muscular atrophy type 1 is a very severe disease. These children are born completely paralyzed. All they have is a little bit of facial movement and eye movements. Um, because they cannot co cooperate with the cough assist, they are intubated 0 0.7 times a year through the third birthday. From the third to the first, fifth birthday, uh, 0 0.3 times a year. Now, after the fifth birthday, when they're able to cooperate with mechanical inexufflation, our patients are rarely hospitalized. 20 years, over 20 years ago, I told the parents of the older boy here that if he didn't get a tracheostomy tube, he'd be dead within one year. Not only did his parents refuse, they also refused gastrostomy tubes. And as a result, these boys have had NG tubes, nasogastric tubes, for over 20 years each. Now, mom got pregnant again, had a second child with also severe SMA type 1. Both of these children have been 24-hour ventilator dependent since four months of age. But I was wrong about them being deceased in one year without a tracheostomy tube. Here they are now at 22 and 20 years of age, among my 10 patients with SMA type 1 over 20 years old. Now they have no muscle movement whatsoever except eye movements. They cannot move their tongues a millimeter. They have no facial movements. But they do not have gastrostomy tubes and they do not have tracheostomy tubes. This is another boy whose parents I told over 20 years ago that he would also be dead in a year without a trach tube. He has average, typical SMA type 1. Not the severe type 1 where you become necessarily vent dependent 24 hours a day before six months of age. He would have become vent dependent had he been trached, however, because only 6% of extubations of patients with SMA type 1 who go into respiratory failure are successful without tracheostomy tubes. And when they get trach, they never breathe again autonomously, and they do not develop the ability to speak with, with severe or typical SMA type 1. Now this is a 25 year, now he's 25 years old, 24 hour user of nasal ventilation, but he can still speak and move his fingers a little bit. And of course I was wrong about him needing a tracheostomy tube as well over 20 years ago. If children with SMA type 1 do not need tracheostomy tubes, you can be sure that no other patients with neuromuscular disease do either, um, with the exception of upper motor neuron and central nervous system disease. We have 72 of these children on 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support now. None of them will ever get tracheostomy tubes, you can be sure. And I'm, I suspect that my patients who are over age 20 with SMA type 1 will likely live another 10, 20, or even 30 years. Now, this is a patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, 24-hour vent dependent, since 14 years of age. He used non-invasive ventilatory support for 27 years and died from a decubitus at age 41. However, the cough assist was critical for him every time he had a respiratory infection, as it is for the patients with SMA and all of my patients with neuromuscular disease. A patient with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, 25 years of non-invasive ventilatory support, died at age 48 from an arrhythmia. Uh, this patient also was saved from respiratory failure and hospitalizations many times by using mechanical inexufflation. A patient with ALS, 29 years old, diagnosed with ALS, became 24-hour dependent on non-invasive support for 13 months, then refused tracheotomy when she really did need it because the cough assist flows were decreasing below 100 liters a minute, um, and she died. Another patient with ALS, uh, same story. He also refused tracheotomy after over a year of 24-hour non-invasive ventilation. We have removed the tracheostomy tubes of a number of patients with ALS who did not need the tubes in the first place. We, and you will see an example shortly. shortly. 
This is a woman who had polio in 1954. She's been on 24-hour non-invasive ventilatory support using a simple mouthpiece during the day as the Duchenne patients that she saw and a lip seal to hold the mouthpiece in place overnight. She has been doing this for 63 years, 24 hours a day, and she works full-time as a rehabilitation counselor, even though she has no movement below her neck. And this is a spinal cord patient whose tracheostomy tube we removed in 1992. She still is dependent on non-invasive ventilation, and she's over 40 years old now. For Duchenne muscular dystrophy in Hokkaido, where they learned this from us, uh, they stopped tracking Duchenne patients in 1993, and their patients now are, are, have died at the average age of 29. However, since 93, none of their patients ha have gotten tracheostomy tubes, and they have over 100 now with an average life expectancy of 40 years, almost 40 years, for a 10-year survival advantage over tracheotomies. So to achieve this, we, we air stack our patients. We do active lung volume recruitment with an AMBU bag. We inflate the patient, the patient's glottis holds consecutively delivered volumes of air. And then we press on the belly to create a cough flow. This is, this is manually assisted coughing. And if your arms are weak, oh, and we have the patient um, cough, this assisted cough, through a peak flow meter and measure that. And that is the assisted cough flow. The assisted cough flows uh, can make your cough flows effective. The assisted coughing can render your cough flows effective. On the left, you see the unassisted cough flow, and on the right, you see the assisted cough flows. This is probably the most important image for demonstrating why we never have to resort to tracheotomy tubes for our patients with neuromuscular disease, any myopathies or spinal muscular atrophy. And by the way, almost half of our ALS patients become 24-hour dependent on non-invasive support uh, for an average of 14 months before they need tracheotomy tubes to survive. We have had patients on, with ALS on non-invasive ventilatory support for 10 years, 24 hours a day, before they required tracheostomy tubes for further survival. So how do we do this? We simply teach the patients how to maintain normal oxygen saturation, which is 95% or more, without supplemental oxygen, especially during chest colds. And how? By using non-invasive ventilatory support as needed, generally 24 hours a day when they're sick, and mechanical and exsufflation for whenever the oxygen saturation decreases below 95%, or if the patient requests it, because they feel that they have to cough. Uh, in this way, they return desaturations to normal, and that prevents pneumonia. The, uh, a chest x-ray is insignificant by comparison to the oximeter. The chest x-rays linger for up to days behind the clinical picture. If the saturation baseline remains normal, I advise my patients to stay home where they can have continuous access to mechanical and exsufflation. If they go to, if they call emergency services, they're going to have to tell them not to give them oxygen without normalizing their CO2 with non-invasive ventilation, without normalizing their oxygen saturation with mechanical and exsufflation, and if they force them to take oxygen, they must be warned, the emergency services, that they must be ready to intubate the patient immediately because oxygen supplementation can acutely cause the, carbon, the CO2 levels to increase by over 100 millimeters of mercury and the patient's arrest. This is the fate of almost all the patients who do not come to us for non-invasive ventilatory support and uh, appropriate use of the cough assist and mechanical and exsufflation. Uh, oxygen and sedatives depress ventilatory drive. Oxygen also causes the CO2 to increase by displacing CO2 in the hemoglobin. There are many mechanisms for all of this, which I really don't have time to go into now, but you can read about them from my articles and books. This was a patient who was intubated on a Friday afternoon. She had um, traveled here, fell down stairs, and uh, broke her C3 uh, vertebra, uh, became um, uh, functionally a C3 uh, a tetraplegic. Uh, her vital capacity was under 200 milliliters. She was immediately intubated on a Friday afternoon. When I came in and saw her on Monday, because I was in Denver at the time, 
um, um, we extubated her. However, even though she could not pass any ventilator weaning parameters uh, or spontaneous breathing trials, she did not have an adequate cough. She had no cough. Uh, she, had, she had a lot of secretions. She could not tolerate low levels of pressure support for any period of time. Um, she simply had, she was, she had no ventilator weaning ability, but we extubated her because she passed our criteria. Uh, and that is to be afebrile with the normal white blood cell count, to be ventilated to a PCO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury or less, um, and um, to have her oxyhemoglobin saturation baseline remain normal for at least 12 hours in ambient air and to be fully alert and cooperative without receiving um, significant sedative medications. And we also like to have the chest x-rays clearing or cleared. So um, the other point is that we normalize the CO2 at a normal physiologic respiratory rate. A permissive hypercapnia is fine for patients with ARDS and lung disease but not appropriate for patients with healthy lungs but respiratory muscle insufficiency. Uh, the patients uh, who are put on uh, uh, rapid uh, ventilatory rates, like 30 a minute, with uh, low pressures, uh, hypo may achieve a normal CO2, but at the cost of decreasing lung compliance and elasticity and uh, atelectasis because of under uh, ventilation of the lungs. When this is done, patients should almost should certainly be placed on automatic size, but the size on many ventilators are limited to inadequate uh, volumes. So we put our patients on full ventilatory support settings with physiologic backup rates. So for adults, that would be about 12, and we would give them probably 500 to 700 or 600 uh, milliliters of um, uh, volumes or we would use pressure uh, control of 18 to 20 centimeters of water. But again, the oxygen saturation baseline must be normal for at least 12 hours before we would extubate a patient who is unweanable, or for that matter, anybody else with neuromuscular disease. So we extubated her directly to nasal ventilation, and we showed her how to use mouthpiece ventilation. So what we do is, again, we shut off the oxygen and we look at the oxygen saturation. We normalize the CO2 and we look at the oxygen saturation. 83% of the time, the oxygen saturation baseline of patients transferred to us is low, lower than 95%. This is because the critical care units that send us their patients, because their patients refuse tracheostomy tubes, did not use the cough assist through the translaryngeal tubes. When you do not use the covices through the translaryngeal tubes to clear the secretions, you may never clear them and think that your patients and switch your patients from one antibiotic to another uh, as the bacteria become resistant to the antibiotics because you're simply not clearing the airways. Within one to three days, almost invariably, when we place our patients on mechanical inexufflation through the translaryngeal tubes, every single hour while they're awake, Within one to three days, the baseline saturation returns to normal, and our patients are ready to be extubated. When we extubate the patient, uh, we have a family member in the critical care unit. In fact, I won't accept a transfer from any other hospital anywhere unless I have a, uh, an agreement by the care providers that they will be with their relative or the patient for the first 24 to 36 hours after extubation, specifically to watch the oximeter and use the inexiflator every time there's a desaturation. Because if the critical care people begin to apply supplemental oxygen after the desaturation, the patients will cycle downwards. They'll continue to, the, the, the supplemental oxygen is tantamount to putting a Band-Aid on a cancer where the cancer is what's causing the desaturation. That's underventilation or usually airway secretions. Now the underventilation may be from, air, from leak. So if the positive inspiratory pressure on the vent gauge is low, we inspect for airway leak. But we also check the CO2. The CO2 should be normal or low as well. If this is true, then the problem must be airway secretions. 
uh, and we use, we have the family, we train the family to use mechanical and exsufflation at pressures of 40 to 60, as I said, for every desaturation uh, and for whenever the patient requests it because they need to cough. As a result, we have essentially a 100% success rate, literally 98 to 99% success rate at extubating patients who are completely unweanable but who have healthy lungs without traching them. As we extubated this woman, we used the cough assist to clear her airway secretions. She decided to use mouthpiece ventilation rather than nasal. Now I showed her how to use the lip seal, and there are lip seals similar to this on the market today. And I told the, I told the nurses that when she sleeps at night to put her on the lip seal. However, she was a Polish lady who did not speak English. She did not want to use a lip seal. So she fell asleep using the mouthpiece like this. Now I knew that from 1954 until 1964, all the patients who used mouthpiece ventilation around the clock did not have lip seals to use, and none of them died. So I was confident that, in, and especially in critical care, she would not lose the mouthpiece and die either. However, the nurses called me at 3 o'clock in the morning and told me that she was sleeping without a lip seal. Uh, however, her saturation baseline was normal, and she was perfectly fine, so I told them not to worry about it. And in fact, she did fine. She never desaturated and she w was ventilated more than adequately all night. And she continued to be well after, ex after uh, discharge. We, we reported 157 such cases of patients who were unweanable and most of whom were transferred to our hospital from out of state. Um, and we were able to extubate them all thanks to non-invasive ventilatory support and mechanical insufflation exsufflation. In many cases, we could not have achieved this. In fact, in most cases, we probably would not have achieved this without mechanical insufflation exsufflation used via the tube to prepare the patient for extubation and used via the upper airway by the patient's family in the critical care unit after extubation. And these were the diagnoses of our unweanable patients who we extubated. ALS, Duchenne, non-critical uh, uh, care neuromyopathy. These are patients who are maybe 80 years old, simply had a medical illness, became too weak to breathe because of being in critical care. They are too often told that they need tracheostomy tubes. If they can cooperate sufficiently to keep their mouth shut and breathe through a nasal interface, they can be extubated without getting a tracheostomy tube, provided that you have mechanical inexsufflation handy. Other muscular dystrophies, myasthenia gravis, post-polio syndrome, spinal muscular atrophy, spinal cord injury, and other neuromuscular conditions. Two years ago, we reported another 98 patients, basically the same. However, we showed that by using mechanical inexsufflation, their vital capacities increased dramatically, both before extubation and after extubation. In fact, in 1990, we reported the routine tracheostomy tube removal, what I call decannulation, of spinal cord patients, many of whom were unweanable. And we challenged other units around the country to do this as well. Only one unit has been doing this, and that is in Portugal. Uh, physicians in the rehab centers in the United States, I guess, have not been brave enough to attempt this uh, on their own at this point. But there's no reason why this shouldn't be done, because if you remove the tracheostomy tubes of unweanable patients, you can actually teach them how to glossopharyngeal breathe uh, and this will permit them to ventilate their lungs all day long without even using a ventilator, provided that they have bulbar muscle function. Now, I will leave you to look this up. You can, you can Google it on the internet, look up frog breathing, but polio patients, Duchenne patients, spinal cord patients can frog breathe for ventilator-free breathing ability if you don't stick a tube in their necks, and they do not need those tubes. This is an ALS patient who was on trach ventilation for two years, 24 hours a day. She did not like her tracheostomy tube, just as you or I would not like to have tracheostomy tubes, and none of the patients want them, but they're told they have no option. But we took her tracheostomy tube out. We inflated her lungs by air stacking. We measured the assisted cough flows. They were over 160 liters a minute, and 120 liters a minute is our principal criterion for knowing that the patient does not need a tracheostomy tube. So we took it out and didn't put it back in. Lou covered the site with Tegaderm, although we prefer a Duoderm to do this. We get a cane tip, we cut down the walls of the cane tip, and Lou puts tape over the cane tip. And then for counter pressure, we, for counter -pressure, we use an ACE bandage, 
because the air going through the nose and mouth would otherwise go through the ostomy, but this helps. And then the patient went home using nasal ventilation at night and mouthpiece ventilation during the day. In 2010, 22 centers in 18 countries put together their data on SMA type 1, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and ALS, and we reported 760 patients who at that time were 24-hour vent dependent without tracheostomy tubes. Uh, virtually all of them had rapid access to mechanical inexufflation to prevent respiratory failure, and all those who did develop respiratory failure were extubated in multiple centers without resort to tracheostomy tubes, even though they were 24-hour vent dependent before they got intubated, and they remained unweanable, of course. When the mechanical inexflation flows do not exceed 100 liters a minute in adults, and airway secretions cause oxygen saturation to remain below 95%, despite it, patients need tracheostomy tubes. As I mentioned, this only occurs in ALS and in central nervous system disease like brain injury, stroke, and so on. In babies who get hospitalized frequently for pneumonia, when we measure their inexufflation flows, we usually get less than 100 liters a minute because their airways are closed and they don't cooperate. However, in SMA type 1, when we get 50 or 60 liters in children and in babies and in infants, as they get older, those flows go up. When they're 20 years old, we get 250 to 360 liters a minute of exufflation flows. The opposite happens with ALS, and that's why ALS patients need trach tubes, and SMA patients do not. Conclusion, no one with any myopathic or lower motor neuron um, neuromuscular disorder needs a tracheostomy tube for even continuous ventilatory support. Only patients with central nervous system disease and or upper motor neuron disease, such as occurs in ALS, and whose mechanical inexufflation ex Exufflation flows. I, I call them mechanical inexufflation, exufflation or expiration flows or exhalation flows diminish to about 100 liters a minute and who aspirate airway secretions such that the oxygen saturation baseline remains below 95 percent, need tracheostomy tubes for prolonged survival. Also, <clears throat> mechanical inexufflation is safe to use at 60 to 70 centimeters of water via invasive airway tubes and at 40 to 60 via the upper. Now, how do I know this? How do I know this? Well, I'll tell you how I know this. My patients air stack with ambu bags to pressures of 60 to 70, sometimes 80 centimeters of water, three times a day for 10 to 15 cycles each. Many of my patients have been doing this for over 50 years. There has not been a single clinical pneumothorax in any of these patients. We had one patient develop a pressure pneumothorax after seven years of continuous non-invasive ventilatory support, and of course he used the cough assist every day as well for lung volume recruitment. Uh, so it is extremely rare, almost extremely rare to have barrel trauma or volume trauma from using the cough assist or non-invasive ventilatory support in any patients with neuromuscular weakness, what we call ventilatory pump failure. Definitive non-invasive manage management can require rapid access to mechanical inexufflation. In the United States, most of my patients have these devices. However, when I lecture elsewhere, they don't. But, but they have to do as I did before Mr. Emerson gave me these devices in 1988. Uh, I used five cofflators that had been off the market since 1967. My patients shared them until 1988, and in fact, until 1993, when uh, the Emerson inexufflator came on the market. Now, these are two websites that will literally save your patient's necks, literally and figuratively. www.breathenvs.com is breathe non-invasive ventilatory support.com. Uh, this has all the information I've just given you and a lot more and all the centers in the world that manage respiratory muscle failure without resort to invasive airway tubes. If you simply refer a patient to these websites, you will be a hero to them. I can guarantee you that. Nobody wants a tracheostomy tube. And also, breathebb.com is a patient forum where patients could put questions to us and to other patients and their families. Um, I, am, I am updating my last book right now, um, so I will hopefully in a few months have that available as well.
Uh, and I will send you back now to our moderator, Mr. Louis Saperito. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bach, for this most informative and important presentation. Uh, we have a lot of good questions coming in that we will get to in a little while. Uh, just a few other housekeeping items here. Uh, reminded that this educational activity is approved for one contact hour. And to obtain CE credits, go to uh, saxtesting.com. Uh, you will need to register at the site, complete the evaluation, uh, successfully completion. You will be able to print the certificate of completion. Support, once again, uh, for this act, educational activity has been provided by Philips Healthcare. The on-demand version will be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. So I will move now to uh, some questions. And uh, we had some very interesting ones that came in. Uh, the first question is from uh, FISA. And FISA is asking why, uh, or please, do, please explain why T-tube uh, cannot be removed, or tracheostomy tube, cannot be removed with tracheal stenosis. Uh, Dr. Bach, would you like to comment on that? Yes, because of the tracheal stenosis, you have a fixed uh, airway obstruction that doesn't permit coffices flows to be sufficiently uh, effective to expulse airway debris. In fact, sometimes the stenosis is so bad that the patients cannot breathe through the upper airway. Uh, not, not only can you not expel airway secretions, you, you, they cannot even breathe because the stenosis is that bad. If the stenosis is relatively minor and the, cough, and the uh, assisted cough flows can exceed 120 liters a minute, we would still take the tracheostomy tube out. Okay, Matthew and Lauren uh, both asked the same question. I don't know if they're together, but uh, uh, they're asking if the pressures for pediatric patients are the same as for adults. And also Excellent question. Excellent question, and the answer is absolutely yes. The pressures on the machine are not the pressures in the lungs, and when, a, when you inflate, uh, when you use non-invasive ventilatory support, you, for someone with zero vital capacity, whether it's a baby, an infant, or an adult, you have to give a pressure of about 15 to 25 centimeters of water, generally 18 to 20. It doesn't matter whether it is an infant or an adult. Likewise, with the cough assist, you use pressures of 40 to 60 centimeters of water, but the baby is not in sync with the machine, so it doesn't. Uh, it's not as effective in small children as it is in adults. But you, um, if you use two lower pressures, and the patient is in sync with the machine, uh, the patient won't be able to breathe enough because it will take too long to inflate the lungs and empty them. So yes, and, and certainly in general, you use the same pressures in infants, children, and adults. And the second part of that question was also just a, a quick distinction between NIV and NVS. Well, again, NIV has come to mean CPAP, which is completely useless, and bi-level PAP, which is usually used at, at uh, drive pressures that are less than 15 millimeters of mercury. So they'll help a little initially, but as your patients get weaker, they won't be adequate, and the, and the patients will go into respiratory failure anyway. Use full ventilatory support settings. In fact, we use invariably volumes of 800 to 1500 milliliter of volumes that we let the respiratory therapists use with the patients and let the patients choose what they like to use. And uh, in, in small children, of, we use pressure settings of about 15 to 20 centimeters of water. But you see, with pressure, you cannot air stack. You cannot do active lung volume recruitment, which is so important to maintain the elasticity of the lungs. So with adults, we always prefer volume cycling, and we set the volumes at 800 to 1500. We don't do 15 milliliters per kilogram, because this is not a closed system. This is an open system where the patients vary their tidal volumes, just like you and I are doing right now. So some patients will take the whole 1500, some will take nothing for each breath, and, and so on. When they want to cough or, or shout, they'll take the 1500. They may hold that 1500, get another 1500 on top of it, and this is precisely what we mean by air stacking and active lung volume recruitment. You cannot do that with lower volumes, and you certainly cannot do that at all if you pressure preset your machine. Yeah, so we felt the need to distinguish and, and come up with a, a better term, uh, non-invasive ventilatory support, since uh, many times patients come in with ventilators to our clinic and uh, people or other physicians that see them are calling them a BiPAP machine simply because they have an interface that's normally used on a BiPAP machine, such as a nose piece or a full face masks. 
uh, even mouthpieces are sometimes referred to as BiPAP. So we, we felt, uh, Dr. Bach felt the need to relabel this. Uh, also, Tiffany um, is asking, uh, how effective in quadriplegics is cough assist? Well, the cough assist um, is extremely effective in tetraplegics, but, you know, normally tetraplegics from spinal cord injury have intact bulbar innervated musculature. When their musculature is completely intact, they can air stack to three, four, even more than four liters of air, and then if you press on their bellies, you can get cough flows well over 300 or even 400 liters a minute. Now, that's more than adequate to clear the airways, even without a cough assist. The cough assist is most effective for patients who have bulbar muscle weakness, even patients with no bar, bulbar muscle function whatsoever. Now, with that being said, it, there, it is a lot of effort to pump a patient up with air and press on the stomach and maybe press a little bit on the chest too. So the cough assist makes expulsion of airway secretions much easier for tetraplegics and absolutely necessary for patients with bulbar muscle weakness. Okay, Marsha um, Marcia works in an outpatient setting, and her question is, uh, what percentage of hospitals uh, use the cough assist, um, and are they typically large ones, and, and is it too expensive for smaller, like such as uh, rural facilities, uh, to use the cough assist? Um, cough, the cough assist is much, much cheaper than any ventilator, so it's not a question of expense. Now, we I don't think Lou and I can very much answer that question. There are hospitals around us in New Jersey who certainly have them, but we, I don't know the percentage of hospitals around the country that have cough assist. Typically, the critical care doctors and doctors in general are terrified of barotrauma, which they see in their lung disease patients, their AR, ARDS patients, and so on, which is completely inappropriate for patients that we take care of. So because of that, they're very reluctant to order cough assist uh, for their patients uh, and get them for the hospitals. Now, perhaps, Lou, you can uh, comment on your experience with your therapist going to hospitals around the tri-state area. Uh, there's still a lot of resistance. Not many of the facilities do use it with any regularity. Uh, a few may have machines, but it's um, it's difficult to put into use. Um, uh, oftentimes, it's a labor issue. You know, uh, many times, just working in our facility where we have plenty of cough assist, we we, are, we arrive on a floor where we've been asked to consult with about a patient, and therapists look at us like, oh my God, here, here they come uh, giving us more work to do. So we try to point out that, um, yes, it's a little more work and, you know, we'll be here to help you, but this patient will progress much more quickly and will will probably extubate soon or be decannulated as a result and uh, and therefore move through the medical process much more quickly. Now, this, this could be especially uh, more important to smaller facilities that don't have big budgets. A lot of our interest is, uh, John, as you, you know, know, is from out of the country where uh, smaller, less developed countries are very interested because they see it as a cost-saving measure. It, it can prevent intubation in, in, in patients that are outpatients and, and preserve them uh, for many, many years from having uh, more uh, invasive procedures. So I hope that uh, addresses the questions adequately. Uh, okay, uh, Renata uh, is asking about uh, why the expansion uh, from 40 to 60 and 50 to 70 uh, and uh, wondering about lung safety of using these higher pressures on the cough assist. Well, as I just said, uh, these patients do not get barrel trauma or volume trauma, and it's not an expansion. The reason that patients, that f the clinicians are using it inappropriately is because in 1993, when this came on the market, I wrote three review articles for chest, respiratory care, and other journal, another journal, where I said that the cough later, the device that was on the market from 1953 to 1967, and the cough assist or an exaflator were identical, but they were not identical because the cough later was calibrated in millimeters of mercury and the cough assist in centimeters of water. Now, 50, 40, uh, the cough later was extensively studied for physiology in, in the 1950s, and I mean extensively by Alvin Barrick, Bickerman, Siegel, and so on, and uh, there, was, there was no harm in using the cough later at 40 millimeters of mercury. Well, 40 millimeters of mercury is 54.1 centimeters of water. And what I wrote in 1993 was basically to use the uh, 
cough assist at 40 centimeters of water. That was my error, and I'm still, I've been trying to correct this uh, ever since. The cough assist and the cough later, the, the cough assist must be used at 55 centimeters of water pressure, which is 50 to 60. This is not an increase in pressure. This is the way it was always used for the first 15 years and should have been used to this day. And I, I like to point out to, to people that um, uh, it, it's a misplaced concern. Uh, I, I like to say that it's there's actually more um, uh, there's more to worry about for lungs collapsing from under expansion from not using a device like the cough assist in patients uh, who have neuromuscular disease or spinal cord injury who have very limited ability to take a take a deep breath. You, the lungs eventually uh, collapse just from uh, under expansion. That's more of a concern than worrying about the potential for barotrauma, which we never see in these patients. Yeah, I could add that I've been asked many times. I've been told that oh, we have a patient who had a pneumothorax. Should we use the cough assist on this patient? And the patient's usually vent dependent. So what I say to them is set the positive pressure to the pressure on the ventilator because that cannot increase any risk and use a full negative pressure of minus 60 centimeters of water. And every time I've recommended that, the clinicians have called me back and said, well, as a matter of fact, uh, it didn't, you were right, there wasn't any other pneumo problem, and it did help the patient. What Lou said was absolutely true. If you don't get the secretions out, your patient's going to collapse anyway. You've got to do it, and the only way you can do it in many cases is using the, something like the uh, mechanical inexufflation. Um, Manaz is asking about the lip seal and what it looks like. I don't think we had a slide there really showing it uh, and where to obtain them. And I, I know for a fact that they are very difficult. They're in and out of production. Uh, the last production, I believe, was by Malincrot. For a while, it was Puritan and Bennett, which I think is owned, uh, which owns Malincrot Medical. Um, so they are difficult to obtain uh, off and on. But um, uh, Dr. Bach, I don't think you had a slide in there that did show the actual uh, lip seal. It, it's basically a mouthpiece, like a standard nebulizer type mouthpiece, uh, which is inserted through a rubber gasket, which covers the lips. And then there's, there's a strap uh, that uh, usually it comes with a very thin strap. We just add a headgear that would commonly be used on a, on a nasal interface. Uh, but it's basically a, a mouthpiece with a rubber seal around it that presses. It, it's a little like a scuba. Uh, looks like, kind of like a scuba mouthpiece, but on the outside of the lips. Well, Lou, you didn't mention that the Oracle is still available. The Oracle is basically a lip seal without yeah. straps. It, right. uh, there's a flange that goes between the teeth and the lips that holds the mouthpiece in and right. seals the lips. And mm -hmm. now, you know, it's a common mistake if someone is using nasal ventilation and there are 3% of patients, there is excessive leak out of the mouth that causes the patient to wake up uh, short of breath at night. 3%, that's all. So almost almost everybody can use nasal ventilation even when their vital capacities are zero. However, for that 3%, you can either put cotton in the nostrils and cover them or switch them to an oral nasal interface uh, or simply ventilate through the mouth using something like an oracle. Uh, but, but I want to point out, don't try to stuff the mouth or put tape on the mouth and ventilate through the nose because these methods simply don't work you're better off covering the nose and mouth with an oral nasal interface or simply ventilating through the mouth using an oracle or a lip seal if you can get one. Okay, there's Matthew again, two more times. <laughs> uh, with insufflation pressure um, suggested between 40 and 60, is there concern regarding bypassing the LES, causing abdominal extension? Okay. Um, uh, Eddie, um, yes. mm -hmm. no, 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 see, uh, you're awake when you're using the cough assist generally. So when you use the cough assist, you're breathing with the machine. Um, what uh, causes air insufflation into the belly, now normally the lower esophagogastric sphincter is supposed to be uh, solid to 25 centimeters of water pressure. Remember, we use preferentially volume preset ventilation during sleep so that patients can air stack any time at night so that they can keep their lungs healthy and speak louder and cough without necessarily needing assistance. Uh, however, when they close their throats, uh, the air under high pressure goes into the stomach. Now, when patients have gastrostomy tubes, they can burp the air out, or the air will pass as flatus in the morning when the patients get up in the wheelchair. But 
the greater risk for abdominal distension is actually using volume preset ventilation at any pressure than using the cough assist at 40 to 60 centimeters of water pressure. Okay, and Crystal is asking, um, uh, what times do you use for your inspiratory and expiratory times? And John, I, I think I can answer that. It, it's, uh, for adults, I generally start at two seconds of inspiratory and two seconds of expiratory. We generally don't need or use the pause uh, portion of that. Uh, for pediatric patients, uh, of course, you want a, a shorter time. It, it would be like one uh, to, to maybe half a second for inspiration and, um, and maybe one second for ex, ex, exflation. But you really, uh, the, the main determinant is the motion of the chest. You want to see full expansion. Expansion and then maximum expansion when the chest stops moving. And then you, you reverse to the negative pressure. Uh, if you use the automatic mode, you want to set that so that it's adequate to achieve full expansion and then achieve full exflation so that you get your best effect. If you cut it off too short, you're not going to get full effect from the machine. Uh, yeah, I generally so listen, Lou, Lou, yes. Lou. Right, but I think you actually point out backwards. First, you watch the patient. <laughs> When, when the patient's chest is fully expanded, you see how much time that takes. Yes. And when it's fully empty, you see how much time that takes, and then you can set the time. But, right. but you've got to watch your patient. Treat your patient. Don't yeah. be you know, fiddling with uh, numbers. Right, Lou? Yeah. Yes. I actually, in, in my initial evaluations, I actually use it in the manual mode, and I don't even really yes. look carefully at the time. I just look at the chest and apply pressure until I get full expansion and then full exflation. Now, not everybody you know, feels good the first time around, so, you know, we do it manually, and then we judge afterwards how many seconds it took. So it, it's, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, but, but generally um, the chest is the guide, as Dr. Box is pointing out. Adrian, I'll just read this. Um, when you talk about MIE pressures, 40 to 60 is only inspiratory pressure or the difference between I and E pressure. No, it's, it's the time, it's the pressure of inspirate, inspirator, uh, inspiration, which is a positive number, and then the pressure of for exflation is a negative number. So we're using 40 plus and 40 minus, let's say, as a starter, and then we're moving quickly to 60 plus for inspiratory and negative 60 uh, for exflation. So each one is, is a separate settings. Well, gentlemen, Dr. Bach and Lou, I want to thank you very much for your time with us today. This session has been so informative. It's been such a pleasure working with you. I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well, those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session, we thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now this does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.